All right. <clears throat> so um, today's topic um, is network structure and uh, visualization. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to cover a bunch of small topics that are actually very, very practical and will allow you to analyze networks. So we'll talk about it first um, about key core decomposition. And um, we'll look into um, what's called network motifs or frequent patterns in the graphs. Uh, we'll talk about um, assortative mixing or a very particular property of networks and um, the way um, nodes are connected to networks. And then we'll spend some time um, looking at the different network visualization uh, techniques. And I'll, I'll also talk a little bit about visualization, external, external to our visualization tools. Um, so as usual, pretty much all the topics or all of these topics, um, there are functions in R, in iGraph, and uh, so you'll not have to code things, but just, you know, you can just use them. Um, and the goal here to really understand what those functions do. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, I want to look at this cartoon um, of, of a network. And, um, you know, after, after a while, people realize that most of the social networks and networks people work with, they actually have, you know, a lot of similarity in their structure in the sense that um, the network usually has very tight core, very tight core in the center. And um, quite often there are sort of, you know, on the periphery of the graph, there are some hanging out communities. And last time when we talked about community detection, um, you know, if we use those techniques and apply it to this graph, we should be easy. We should be. We should easily find um, this type of communities. We should be easily find the smallest cuts. So we should be able to disconnect those communities from the main graph and detect them. But at the same time, we would typically see one big community, very tightly coupled, um, that will be left, and that will be the, the core of the graph. Now, the word core actually has a pretty formal. Uh, definition, um, and I will spend some time on this. So K core of the graph, it's called K core, um, is the largest subgraph such that each vertex is connected to at least K other vertices in a subset. So K cores of the graph, they are um, sort of included subgraphs, one in term, in one into another. Um, it's a sort of Matryoshka structure, right, where you have things placed one into another inclusively. So let's take a look at this picture. At, at this, um, at this picture, I think it's it's, it's very telling. Um, so the one core of the graph would be right here. If we look at those nodes, we realize that every node in in that group of nodes in that subgraph. Um, every node, every vertex is connected to at least one other vertex. Okay? So every node vertex is connected to at least one other vertex. Well, in other way, uh, to say this, one core is actually is a connected component of the graph. Now, two core, it is this group of nodes. Right? This is a subgraph where every vertex connected at least to two nodes within the same subgraph. So notice, um, this has degree two, this has degree two. This node has a higher than two degree, but it is also inside, so within that subgraph, it connects at least to two degrees. So it connected to more than two nodes, connected to actually um, four nodes, but I, you know, four is greater than two. What's interesting is this node. It is connected to three nodes, but it's connected only to two nodes inside this, you know, the core structure. So again, it's important that we're talking about is a connection um, to the nodes inside the subset. And so what you're gonna, what, what we're gonna see is the bunch of shells, one included into another, and eventually um, we'll reach this sort of very core, um, the one that, that contains nodes of the highest degree. 
So every vertex in, in, in the core has degree greater or equal to this core number. Um, and you know, k plus one subcore is always a subgraph of k core. So they're one included into another. And you can also introduce what's called core numbers, which is the highest order of the core that contains particular vertex. So for example, if we look here, um, you know, this is, everything in here is a core number one. But some of the nodes in belong to the higher level of the cores, uh, uh, those nodes. So here's a group of nodes that belong to core number one, but do not belong to core number two. And so they have what's called core, um, their core number is one, and they, they, they call uh, not K cores, but this, this number is, I'm mean, sorry, this nodes by the cells, they K shell. So they, they sort of K shell number one. So you can, call these guys, um, you know, shells. Now, why um, I'm talking about this? Well, um, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, when you try to, um, you know, understand graphs, it's actually very, very good to be able to find this very, very tightly connected central um, structure and things to build around it. Uh, but also, this algorithm is extremely powerful because of um, its computational properties. Um, it's almost linear algorithm um, to, there, there, is, there exists almost linear algorithm to find those cores. Um, and that means the algorithm works for very, very large networks. Um, and, and that's you know, extremely helpful. So here's an example. Um, well, unfortunately, I don't know if you can actually see those connections right now on the graph. Ah. All right, um, anyway, so I'll, I'll try to emphasize them. Um, if you don't see this, uh, you know there are, there are edges, of course, everywhere here. But it's all edges, right? And what's done is um, I color coded the nodes according to their core numbers. So core number one are those red nodes. Um, core number two. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, I'm sorry, shell number, well, nodes with core number one are red nodes, nodes with core number two um, are uh, pale green nodes, um, then number three is bright green nodes, um, etc. And so if you look at the original graph, there are a lot of, you know, this sort of low degree nodes sticking out, right, right here. These are all connected. So if I start doing this core decomposition, I will cut them out. And um, in this graph, which corresponds to core number two, core, well, core two, um, it's only nodes that have degree two or greater that are in here. So um, unfortunately, you can barely see it, but every node here in this picture has at least you know two neighbors, right? And you know we keep moving, keep moving along. Um, this is this will be core number three, um, and uh, finally you know we end up digging into the very very center of this graph where there are uh, you know six nodes all connected to each other. Um, after the lecture, please take a look at the slides. You can actually see on the slides um, those the, the connect the connectivity pattern. So, but the point is, you know, if you have a very complex structure, you can start sort of start unraveling it, uh, start disassembling it by using this uh, K core approach by cutting out at first low degrees, then next, 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 next. Now, it's also important to understand that this is not just removing um, nodes with, say, degree, like if we start here, it's not just removing nodes with degree one. Because if I remove nodes with degree one, what's going to happen in the graph? There will be more nodes appear with degree one. So let's say we have um, this kind of structure and that is connected to a graph. Well, this node has a degree one because it has one neighbor. This node has a degree two because it has two neighbors. So, um, but what happens if I remove this node, cut it out, 
the degree of this node will be one. Um, and so in order to find cores, we'll need to get rid of, of this node also. So again, key core decomposition is different from just removing of nodes with their um, you know, degree equal to the number of cores. So key cores gives you, leaves you nodes um, inside the core that has degree equal or greater than the core number. Okay, so again, coloring on this picture um, is done according to K core numbers of the nodes um, and colors shows you that's what's called K shells um, and the graphs themselves, these are K cores of the graph. And then so you can take pretty much any network and decompose it that way. Now, K cores are defined for undirected graphs. And so if you have a directed graph, um, you will need to you know, get rid of, of, of directionality to be able to compute, it, compute them. OK, so any questions about cores? All right, there, there, is, a, there, is, a, there, there is a function in the iGraph that allows you to calculate this um, it's called coreness, and it returns to you. It returns to you uh, this k core number per node, and then you can take those numbers. I mean, k core per node. So every node has you know, the, the, the core number, and you can use it to actually extract those nodes from the graph and build the sort of sequences of nodes of graphs. A uh, very, very, very powerful technique. Very useful. I, I pretty much use it anytime I, I explore graphs. OK, um, second sort of quick, quick topic uh, of today's lecture is really about you know, the lo local structures in the graph. Um, th these definitions come from sociology. Um, you know, they might seem trivial, but it's, they're also pretty useful because they give you some understanding um, of, of graph structure. So um, one of the definitions is it's what's called dyads. The, the idea is the following. Now, we're going to concentrate right now um, on uh, directed graphs. Um, so the graphs that do have direction. Uh, for undirected, this is much more trivial, right? So if we have, um, say, undirected graph, and we have two nodes, there are really you know, two options. There are either well, two nodes, and they're not connected, or there are two nodes, and there is an edge between them. Now, if we have a directed graph, there are three options, right? We either have mutual relations between two nodes, A and B, which means you know, there is an um, edge for going from A to B, and there is an edge going to B, from B to A. We can have asymmetric relations where, no, where edge goes one way, and there is an op option possibility of no edge in between A and C. And, um, um, one of the ways to you know look at the network is to actually see okay what sort of the ratio of um, the number of say asymmetric relations to mutual relations, and that's given to you by this dyad census number. Uh, I mean the function um, it it can compute those numbers, um, and it tells you how much of the reciprocity you have in the network. Right, and I mean, you can instantly think about this. If you, if you're talking about the network, say phone calls, it will tell you, okay, well, if people call each other, or it's sort of one way, you know, messaging, right, that goes away from some center, or you know, graph of friendship, um, you know, where where you, where, where you can look at, uh, you know, how people um, connected and um, sort of who invites who. Um, in, in a friendship. And of course, this is very important for, um, in, in biological networks. Now, we can actually extend this definition uh, to triads, um, as, as we talked uh, to, you know, to the three nodes. Um, as we previously talked, um, in, in general, from the sort of logical point of view, um, the triangle is, is a very, very important figure, right? Because um, it, it's, if, if two people, if, if a person has two friends, right, there's a very high probability that they know each other. So um, there are a lot of triangles in this, in the social networks. 
and um, <clears throat> there is even a particular classification um, of connectivity within those triangles. Um, it's called usually triads, and this is a subgraph of three vertices and various possible ties in between them. Now, traditionally, they even have a very, uh, you know, very particular sort of way of numbering them and indexing. Um, there, there is really, you know, not nothing fancy in here, um, but you know, if you want to be able to decipher what this says, um, here is here is a map. Um, so um, let, let's look, say, at, at the first here. Um, so what we have here is three disconnected nodes, and uh, the way to understand those numbers, say, um, 0, 0, 3. So 1 is just sort of the numbering. Um, it's the first element, second, the third, the fourth, etc. But 0, 0, 3 stands for, OK, there is zero mutual dads, there is um, zero asymmetric dads, and there are three null dyads in this picture. So uh, there, is no, there is no connectivity in this, in this graph. So there is no mutuality, no, no asymmetry, uh, asymmetricity, but it's all null dyads. Um, or if we look, let's say, um, at this picture, what it says is, OK, there is no uh, mutual dads. There is one, as, one asymmetric dad, which is, means there is one direction, and there is uh, two null dyads. So there are two missing edges. Or if we look at this graph, um, there is zero mutual dads. There is three asymmetric dads because there is three directed edges. Um, there is zero null dads because everything is connected. And so that's how the sort of numbering um, is going. And there are 16 um, classes, 16 types of this sort of numbering that can be calculated. And so what you do is if you call a triad census, it will actually tell you for each of this type of, of combinations in the graph how many of those combinations are present. Um, in fact, this is, again, this is very, very important in biological networks because there are particular processes, how, um, say, proteins um, interacting or, or how from genes things being formed, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but you can also think about, um, you know, analyzing this type of behavior in social networks um, where you can realize sort of the dependency in, you know, people making decision, decisions or, or anything else. And you, for example, realize that if there's a circular pattern, if there's a lot of circular patterns, um, you know, in, in the graph, um, that means sort of mutual reinforcement of the things. Um, but if you have this type of patterns, patterns um, this is, looks more like broadcasting from this node to those two nodes. So, or um, if you have that, a lot of this type of patterns, that sort of mutuality um, in, in the communications. And uh, you can actually detect and calculate uh, those numbers. Um, you know, in order to use this, it really takes some practice you know, taking a few graphs and computing that sort of census um, for those graphs. Now, if we can, you know, in fact, you know, we can take this sort of dyads and triads idea and extend it uh, to pretty much any shapes, um, I mean, any number of nodes we want. And um, in fact, um, there, is a, um, there, there is a metric which is called network motifs. Um, and the idea is the following, that network motif is a recurrent statistically significant subgraph um, in graphs. So here is, here is what this is. Um, let's take a look. Let's say here is, there is a graph, okay? And we can look for a motif uh, of three nodes. Um, we again look for sort of three nodes. Like, um, for example, if we take three nodes like that, connected, and start looking for this structure in the graph, well, it doesn't exist. Another possible structure of three nodes is this one, right? And one more possible structure is this one. Um, when, when people talk about graph motifs, they usually talk about connective connected, I'm sorry, connected nodes. And so in our case, this is a graph motive we'll be looking for. So here it is. So how many of those combination of three nodes are present in our graph? Well, you know, there is this combination of three nodes, 
then there is this combination of those three nodes, then there are this combination, and uh, you know one more time, uh, you know there is this combination. So there are four times, you know, four um, isomorphic combinations of, of 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 this type in the graph. So if we calculate how many times this motif happens in the graph, the number will be four. Okay. Now, what's important um, that there is a difference in between this um, motif and um, notion of um, induced subgraph. Now, typically, when people t when when we talk about um, subgraphs, uh, what that means is the following: say, if we have um, this structure, and let's say we add two edges here, and we start talking about um, induced subgraph for this structure, then for three nodes, the induced subgraph will include all the edges. So the induced subgraph will be like that. And um, that means, um, you know, that we, you know, it, it has a connect connection between all the nodes. Um, when we're looking for motifs, we're not looking for induced subgraphs. And that means even in this uh, graph where we already have connection between node one, four, and three, two, uh, we still see four, uh, we still see this type of motifs. motifs. Um, there are just more of them. Now, um, what we're gonna see here is there will be, of this type, there is a motif. Here is this motif of that type, but there is also this motif, and there is also this motif. So for example, in this modified version of the graph, instead of four motifs of this type will have actually um, 12 of them, right? Because we'll have three motifs matching, you know, this here and, and there. So it will be three per corner. So again, so what we do when, when we try to find motifs, it's really about um, finding the patterns, the frequent patterns, um, and those patterns do not necessarily have to include all the connectivity between the nodes in the graph um, when, when you look for the subgraphs. Um, and, and that's sort of what differentiate motifs from um, induced subgraphs, if that sort of, if, if you're familiar with, with those guys. But the point is, again, the, the important point is that this is something that occurs very, very frequently in the graph, some patterns. Now, you know, when I just say frequently, you know, you, you, cannot, you cannot just use that word to actually um, calculate things. And you need to, to compare things. And uh, what's typically done is uh, one compares the number of those motifs in the graph to uh, the number of motifs in the random graph. So what do you want to, what do you want to understand? that if, for example, by whatever reason, um, you have, say, this type of structure or this type of structure um, occur frequently in your graph, well, the question is, uh, you know, what does frequently means? Um, and frequently means, in this case, um, that you see them more than you would expect in a random graph. In a random graph means, uh, and we talked about random graphs, it's when you know, nodes connected at random. And so um, the way to measure things, the way to measure motifs, there is what's called z-score, which gives you the difference of the number of motifs in your graph minus um, the number of these motifs in a random graph. So if where things were connected randomly, um, that will be that many nodes. And, and here is, uh, this, this is usually just standard deviation. So you, you can generate a lot of random graphs and just calculate um, how the, the number of motifs uh, varies in between them. But again, the point is, um, when, you, when you see some structure appearing in the network, um, you really don't understand, you know, if, you, if I count, I'll give you a network of like 200 nodes. And um, this structure appears, let's say, you know, 10 times. Um, the, the question you, you might want to ask yourself is, well, the fact that it appears 
10 times in there. Is it sort of normal or not? So, um, and, and, to call, and to answer that question, you need to compare it to you know, random graph. And uh, that means you know, in, in random graph, connections are random. And, and if in your graph, the appearance is higher than in random graph, that means you know, the, this, this structure is sort of meaningful for your graph. So if we talk about motifs, you know, you can do, you, you, can, you can look at different sizes of motifs. It's clear that if we have a motifs of three nodes, there are really two, only two options. We either have a click, right? There's either this structure or the sort of chain structure. If we look at the undirected graph of four nodes, there are more possibilities, right? We can have this sort of star structure. We can have this chain structure, loops, box, you know, what they call semi-click. Um, a click structure. Now, of course, you know, there is a, uh, a factorial uh, you know, growth in number of possible combinations, number of possible motifs. If we go, you know, and, and look for motifs, you know, five nodes, six nodes, etc. So, you know, theoretically it is possible. In practice, um, it is very, very computa computationally expensive. And so people in practice looking only um, usually look at the motifs of, of size three and motifs of size four. But even with motifs of size four, if we're talking about directed graphs, um, there, are very many, there are very many more possibilities of the connectivity between four nodes. So, you know, Talking about, again, about sort of three-node connectivity, well, th this is really about triads, right? And it's, it is connected triads. It's sort of the same thing as we saw a um, couple of slides ago. You know, these are all options uh, for triads. Now, the, take a pay attention to the word connected. Um, so it's not all the possible triads we exclude from this um, considerations, those situations where you have two nodes, directed edge, and the third node um, is, is disconnected from them. We're looking on the other connected combinations. But motifs can look many more complicated. We can, you, know, you can have this type of motifs or this type of motifs. Um, so it's again some frequent pattern in the structure of the graph. Um, some of them are easier to detect than others. Now, this is just a little bit of computational story. Um, so you'd realize you know, how bad the, the problem is in terms of computing. Um, take a look at this. You know, this is how much time it takes uh, to compute um, those motifs to find them, and this is a logarithmic scale. And this is, a, this is the size of the subgraph. So if you're looking for um, you know, four uh, node motifs, it can take you, say, you know, 10 seconds. But if you're looking for five node motifs, it's already 100 seconds um, for that particular graph. And if you're looking for six node motifs, it's already more than um, 1,000 seconds. So what this tells you is, OK, this is logarithmic scale. So I can just write the logarithm of time equal approximately. And well, you know, this is something that like, like x squared, right, um, where x is a subgraph size. It looks like square here. So it's kind of x squared, so time will go, will, will go um, it's exponential and x squared size. So, which really means um, that, you know, the, the, the scalability is terrible for those algorithms. And uh, um, that again means that, that typically um, you will be restricted to this um, end, which means finding, you know, very, very small motifs if you're interested in them. And um, certain type of networks, they do have a very specific motifs um, that are char characteristic for them. Like, for example, um, say, <clears throat> gene re regulation networks, um, they do have this, um, a lot of this uh, feed forward loops, right? Um, or in food webs, and food webs, um, very typical, this sort of three chain thing. Well, food web is, you know, you have one species that eats another species that eats another species, right? That's what food web is. Um, so we, so we, we can see with, that with gene regulations, yeah, there is, um, there is um, some feed-forward loop where this gene regulates this one, and they both regulate this one. 
Uh, but when, you know, with, with food web, well, okay, you know, if, if this animal, um, you know, if this animal has been eaten by that one, well, you know, you can, the, 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 you cannot have the sort of triangles in, in animals eating each, eating each other, right? Uh, it's a one-way street. Uh, so, and, and there are more sort of more interesting structures, like like for example, um, this uh, feedback loop um, is is very character characteristic for let's say electronic circles. Um, in electronic components, you'll see that a lot, but you'll not see that in in gene regulation networks, um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, the point is that by actually though we, we talked. Um, from the day one that the networks do have a lot of a lot in common and um, you know the, the this ne network science is gives us pretty generic description of all the networks out there um, there are some you know differences and by looking at the network motifs uh, even without knowing what sort of network you study you actually um, can you know learn um, things about local interaction and you for example if you see this type of network and you don't know where the network came from um, by just by, by the fact that there are a lot of um, this uh, feedback loops um, you realize that this network for example cannot be gene regulation networks or food network so um, different types of networks that comes from different sort of you know parts of life they do have you know dominating structures that are different um, and you'll be able to see that. Now, here is a very simple example. Um, this is a, just a small network of, for, for the blogs um, where the web page, where, where the, the nodes are the blogs and the arrows are the, you know, the references, how one blog refers to another one. And you know, by just looking at this graph, you realize that the most frequent structure in here, right, is is going to be something like this. So let's say this one consists of a lots of uh, small structures like that. Okay, um, and you know, even if we if we if we if we look for a structure of four nodes, it's also probably mostly, you know, structures like that because it's it's like you know several um important blogs and and that are being pointed by others or copied information from from them but there are some of course structures like here um which is you have a node you have another node two nodes here and there's a sort of cross references happen here right if you if you look closely here is that um, or, you know, here is another one like that. So, you know, you, you can eyeball this. It's a small, it's a small graph and you can sort of realize what structures are frequent or you can use network motifs to actually study this. And um, again, you know, graph motifs can actually give you a bunch of motifs um, that are, that happens in that network. And um, what's here, I enumerated all the motifs, all the frequent uh, subgraphs that occurs in the network, and um, next to the subgraphs, there is a number of how many times it occurs, and it's sort of totally dominating um, uh, by this construction, which is again, I can you know, it's it's a node, and it points to three nodes which again tells you a lot about the sort of broadcasting kind of structure of the graph. Uh, if you look carefully, there is another one, a very frequent pattern like that. Um, say the pattern we also looked at is right here um, when there is a sort of cross broadcasting uh, between nodes, um, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't look at, at, um, at motifs of size three, but you can easily do that too. So, um, that's how you do the sort of motif investigation of the network. And uh, depending on the, um, you know, on, on, on those frequencies, um, you can actually tell, um, you know, what's sort of important for this particular network. You know, to be fair, in order to draw sort of scientific conclusions from this, I would really need to take and generate a random network um, with the same number of nodes um, and same number of edges 
and then compare um, the, 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 how many of this type of, of say, um, motifs are in random network versus um, in our network. Um, I haven't done it here, but it's sort of obvious that, um, you know, I, and I cannot tell, like, for example, there are eight times here or 20 times here. I cannot tell if that's, uh, you know, a lot or very characteristic for a network or not, but I can definitely tell that this number, you know, that, that this occurs 20,000 times. Yeah, so that means um, it is a feature of this particular graph. So it is important for, for this graph. So that sort of motif study. Um, again, a uh, very, very powerful way to analyze networks. Unfortunately, you cannot do it for uh, um, you know, large motifs, but for small, um, that, that, that's very telling you about the network. Okay, any questions here about the motifs finding and what they are? We good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, next sort of quick topic is um, about what's called mixing patterns. So what we're going to talk about is the following. It's also about you know, connection between nodes. But here, um, the, the question is the following. You have two nodes, and they're connected. And um, the, the question is, OK, you know, those nodes can carry different labels. Like for example, um, you know, this is a blue node. Here is another blue node. Um, here is a red node, and uh, I'll, I'll make another blue node. And the question is, you can ask, OK, let's say you have different type of nodes in the graph. What do you see? Do you see blue nodes connected between themselves and um, in bet among them and say, um, red nodes connected among them? And that's, a, and that's pretty much it. So either a sort of connection based on the properties of the nodes, or do you see in the graph, say, this you know, cross connectivity where you know, nodes of one type connected to the nodes of another type, OK? Um, and um, you know, when the nodes of, well, when the similar nodes connected to each other, um, this is called assortative mixing. And um, which means the attributes of the nodes, of connected nodes, to be, tends to be more similar to each other than if there is no such an edge. And there is a disassortative mix mixing where um, there is a connectivity of in between nodes that are dissimilar. So for example, on this little picture, OK, let me restore this. This is assortative mixing, which means um, similar nodes, nodes that have similar um, attributes, they're connected between themselves. Okay? This is assortative. Um, if I take and uh, um, you know, look at the graph and, um, and what I'm going to see, can okay, restore those two nodes. So if I look at the graph and I see this type of connectivity where nodes of you know, different colors are connected, and you know there might be uh, there might be still connect connection in there. But um, the point that we have most we have a lot of edges between nodes of different color. Well, this will be called disassortative mixing. Okay. So um, by the color of the nodes, I mean like really any attribute, right? Um, you can talk about you know the location, sex, age, you know how much money somebody makes. Um, Etc. And um, you know the, this assortative mixing is a situation when people um, when, when nodes of the similar properties connect to each other. They're very. They're, they're, this is very very common in, in social networks. And you know it's a political beliefs. It's you know you you usually friends with someone who is around your age. Um, and and it's also about the race. Etc. 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 Or you can think about disassortative mixing, again, like you know, food web, where, OK, it's a predator and prey connections. Um, and uh, there is economics networks where there's producers and consumers of goods. Um, you know, financial networks, you know, there, there are banks that are giving loans and people who are receiving loans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, um, there are a bunch of networks where the connect connectivity is what's called disassortative. 
And you can actually calculate against certain numbers that will tell you how much, um, how, how much in your network things, uh, you know, how much is the network is assortative and how much it is sort of disassortative. And you, it, you might find that, you know, you have a very mixed result. So, you know, you have both type of connections and there is no, you know, pronounced sort of assortativity um, in, in the network. But if it is, it tells you a lot also about the network. And um, here's a quick example. This is, you know, famous graph of political polarization on a Twitter where, um, you know, the, it's, it's a retweet network and red, car, red color here is sort of right-leaning uh, bloggers, blue color left-leaning bloggers. And if you realize, um, you know, the, the, the blue guys, right, retweets only blue guys and, and red guys retweets only red guys. And, and so there is a very, very strong assortative mixing um, in this um, in this picture because uh, you know well Democrats uh, retweet and talk to Democrats Republicans to Republicans so it, it's the type of noted political preference or there is another absolutely fascinating uh, picture and study it's uh, tell you the spread of obesity uh, in 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 a, in a community in the large social networks and the yellow notes here. Um, shows you an obese person, and um, you know green nodes are non-obese person, and um, they're connected by edge. And in fact, you know the color of the edge tells you the type of relationships. It's a friendships or or marriages. But the point is that uh, you know if you look carefully into this graph, you realize that there is a strong assortative mixing in here, where in many cases you know yellow nodes they are connected with yellow. So that means, you know, if, if you, if, uh, well, you know, the, 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 it's, it's hard to, to, to uh, extract causality from here, but the point is, you, you know, obese people are friends with obese people, or if you're becoming a friend with a obese person, um, you most likely will also gain weight. That's pretty much what it tells you. Or if somebody in the family uh, becoming obese, there is a high chance for other people to become obese. Um, or, you know, that, that's sort of causality, but, you know, if, if we do not talk about causality, you know, people of the same constituency, so people of, the obese people will actually um, be friends with each other much more than with other people. So this is, again, an example of assortative mixing where like is connected to, you know, the like. And there are you know, as always, there are sort of ways to do it numerically to actually calculate those numbers. Um, so there are a couple of formulas here. Um, just want to, you know, point out what, what the formula does without going into the details. Um, so um, there is a uh, so-called assortativity coefficient that can be computed for a graph. And so what it says is the following. Um, AI, AIJ is adjacency matrix for the graph that tells you about the connectivity pattern. And CI and CJ are the labels of the class. And for example, you know, the label can be color and it's like you know, reds and blues. And so what this says is um, that if there is a connection in between two nodes of the same color, you know, we'll add it up. Okay. And if there is connection between nodes of different colors, it will, this, it will not be participating in the sum. And so this really calculates, counts the connection between similar nodes. And this term, um, this term actually comes from this random graph ideas and it will tell you, if the graph was random, how many, you would, how many connections you would expect between um, those nodes. So the idea is exactly the same way as we did with, with motifs, um, is the following. You look at the graph, you count how many connections you have between the nodes of the same type, but you don't know upfront if that's a lot or not. And so what you want to do is you want to compare this to the number of connections um, that the graph would have if, it, if the connectivity pattern were, was random. Now, compared to that, that, that um, uh, motive finding, in this case, you can actually calculate that. And that's sort of that, the second uh, term in the sum that what it does. So it just compares your actual connectivity pattern to um, the one that random graph of the same you know, degree distribution would have. And then it's just being normalized. 
that what happens when you um, actually calculate this the 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 this assertivity coefficients um, trying to match um, labels across an edge. But in fact, you can have not only labels red and blue, you can also have, you know, an age or, you know, I don't know, 25, 27, um, an age or something, some other sort of scalar number on, on the attribute. And then what you really, oh, I'm sorry, on the, on the node. And then what you really do is you actually compute the correlation and correlation means, you know, it's like traditional correlation between numbers, but you look at the correlation only between nodes that are connected. And that's, again, given to you uh, by this function, and you compare this correlation to the random graph. The point is you can get those two numbers. Um, one number is for discrete mixing, where you have, you know, labels. Another one is for mixing by scalar properties, where you just have numbers associated with nodes. Um, and again, it can be computed for you, and you can have, um, you know, if you have a strong, this assortativity is large, is, is a positive number, um, it tells you that in your network, like people connects with, you know, like people. So the people, so the, the people are connected with similar properties. Um, you know, if you like, for example, look at the society and, uh, um, and, and, and node labeled means the race, race of the people in the society, then the fact that you have, uh, for example, strong assortativity means there is a racial segregation, which means, you know, people of one color um, all only sort of friends with the people of the same color. Um, and if not, well, then you have a very, very much mixed up society. So this is also a way to sort of understand the structure of the network. Um, by, by looking at these numbers. Now, there is um, one more point I would like to make about this sort of assortative mixing, which is, in fact, we can use for the number that corresponds to every node, we can actually use node degree. Now, it's node degree minus one because it's called excessive node degree. Um, this is like details, but um, the point is you can, you can, you can use... Uh, you can use node degrees, um, you know, when you compute this assortative mixing. And it's called assortativity degree, and that really tells us that when you have a node of certain degree, if the nodes of low degrees, if they're connected with nodes of also low degrees, or that's one case, or whether the nodes of low degrees connected to the nodes of high degree, okay? So this will be sort of assortative where low degree is connected to low degrees, and this will be disassortative where you have nodes of low degrees connected to nodes of high degrees. So by those numbers, you can actually, without even drawing the network, you can sort of understand um, the, the, the effects of the structure. So here's an example. Um, this is assortative network where you notice that nodes of degree, of low degree connected to the nodes of low degree, and that creates these chains, right? Um, and, and this type of is disassortative network, where you have fans where the nodes of um, you know, high degree connected to the nodes of low degree. Um, so this is what's called degree assortativity in the network. And um, again, you know, so a lot of social networks, they're actually much more of assortative network than disassortative. So yet this is yet another sort of way to you know, get insight about the structure of the network. But I mean, ultimately, of course, you know, if you can, um, the, the best way to understand the network is to just look at it, right? Because, you know, I mean, it's better to, you know, to see once than hear many, many times. And so, you know, network visualization is really, is extremely powerful in this case. And if you notice on, on all previous slides, I used network visualization. I computed numbers and then was trying to convince you that those numbers make sense by sort of showing you um, the, the network, right, what it looks like. So when we do network visualization, you know, it's usually you're trying to draw nodes and edges. And you know you also want to encode 
um, certain attributes, node attributes and edge attributes. Um, and, and here, you know, I, I like this little picture because it, 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 it contains lots and lots of information, right? It shows you uh, nodes and there's the size of the nodes, the color of the node, shows you edges, you know, the color of the edges. But in order to draw the network, what you really need to do, um, when, you, when you have a network, you know, you're usually given a matrix, an um, adjacency matrix that tells you the connectivity between different nodes. But what you really need in order to draw a network is you need for every vertex that is in the, in the graph, you need the coordinates. And since we tend to draw everything in two dimensions on the plane, all right, and this is x, this is y, so for every node, for every node, we need to know where to draw it, so what x coordinate and what y coordinate it need to have. And so, you know, when you, for example, take right now um, the, the, the graph, that's a sort of, you, you take r and want to draw a network, and you issue command plot, um, and you give here some graph. Well, internally, this plot, in fact, goes and generates sets of uh, coordinates where it can draw uh, and position uh, network nodes and then connects them with edges. And so those coordinates are called graph layout and there are different, way, different ways to do it. So the simplest way, uh, and you know, sometimes it's actually quite useful, um, is uh, to sort of have independently on the connectivity pattern on the graph, just place nodes somewhere. And uh, you know, the simplest way would be like take a circle layout where all the nodes will be positions on the, around the circle independently on the connectivity pattern. Or you can have a grid layout where you can place all nodes um, somewhere on the grid. Again, it does not depend on the connectivity pattern. So you, if you notice, um, you know, here nodes are nicely positioned on a circle, here are no, nodes nicely positioned on a, uh, on a grid, uh, but the connections between them, you know, the edges are all over the place. Um, another option is like really random layout where you randomly assign, um, randomly assign uh, coordinates to every node, and so that that really looks like a mess. Um, but you know, sometimes you know, you, you, you might want to use that. Um, and again, in iGraph, there there are a bunch of these layouts you can call, and it will just generate that for you. You call this, um, you can call that say within plot function by saying layout equal, and you know provide one of those types of layouts. Um, but what's more interesting and what we usually use, what I usually use in lectures when I show you graphs, um, are one of the sort of force directed layouts. And the idea is that um, you, know, you want to position nodes in such a way um, that uh, you know, the, 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 the connectivity um, will not look like a mess. So you probably want to have nodes that are connected to each other to be placed next to each other and you want sort of to be able to see um, the structure of the edges, right? How edges actually connect parts of the, of the graph. Now within um, iGraph, well, overall there are a bunch of those methods. Um, here are the several of them. This is what's called spring-based layout. Um, There's uh, Kamada Kawai and uh, Fruitman Ringold, they're sort of you know, famous um, graph layouts algorithms. This algorithm allows you, or gives you for every node of the graph a particular position um, in, in a coordinate systems where the node has to be uh, drawn. Now, all of these um, layouts, they are based on the same idea. Um, the idea is the following, um, that you, know, you can think of um, the graph as a bunch of spring, bench, bench of masses connected by springs, right? Think about it this way, you have a graph and here's your nodes and every node is a mass and if there is a, uh, there is a point with a mass and if uh, there is an edge between two nodes, it means um, they're connected by a spring, right? And so imagine this kind of system. Now, if you just let the system go, it, you know, it will most likely collapse because springs will um, attach, uh, will attract all the nodes uh, together. So what you can do, is you can add sort of external forces and let's say you know you can add some um, repulsion 
uh, between the nodes, for example. Um, think about them, if you remember a little bit of physics, um, that they, they will be like charged and so they will repel. And so the point is you will have sort of the forces that attract nodes and the forces that repel nodes. And then you solve an optimization problem that sort of balances this out and creates some sort of, uh, you know, optimal uh, distribution. And for example, for Kamada Kawai, um, there is this particular function which is called stress that's being optimized. And, you know, if you look at this, you realize these are coordinates of the nodes. Um, here, what it says, okay, if the nodes can, th this nodes, add, add this to stress function only, only if the nodes are connected. And so what this says, okay, here's the distance between two nodes, and we want it to be uh, close to some particular parameter um, that we selected. And uh, so this type of optimization allows you to locate um, graphs, to locate nodes and, and make them visible. Now, the problem with this compared to like say circular layout or, um, or um, you know, grid layout is that there is really a, a quite complex optimization problem going on when you try to do this. And that means, you know, it works like a charm for, for graphs of the size of, you know, 30 nodes. Um, but if you feed, you know, graph of 1,000 nodes, um, you most likely will end up waiting for a while, and you might not, maybe you will not even get a good picture after that. So, I mean, these layouts are great, but, you know, be aware that for very large networks, you might not be able to compute them, or they will not look as good um, as you want them to look. Now, there is another set of, of layouts um, that uh, people use, and those layouts are uh, called you know, either multidimensional scaling or principal component analysis. Um, and if you're a little bit familiar with the statistical um, analysis of data, this is a way um, to um, analyze algorithms. Uh, you know, when you look at, at the data, um, you can calculate uh, what's called you know, principal components on the data, and you can use them um, in terms of like sort of projecting onto low dimensional space. Now, there are a lot of words in here. Um, I really don't want to go into the details explaining, um, you know, the details of how this works, but the point is that you have a matrix that gives you a connectivity pattern, and you can calculate based on this matrix certain um, sort of embedding of, of the data points. Now, and you can use it as, as, their, as a coordinates for the graph. Now, the problem here is, you know, it's, it's called layout SVD and layout MDS. Um, but the problem here is that layouts are typically not that great. So, um, you know, I, I would, I, I could, tr you know, I, I would recommend maybe trying them, but don't expect to see any good results. Um, so probably those previous layouts are, are the best ones. Speaking of graph visualization, there is another important uh, way to do this. Um, take a look at this. Um, here is a graph, and we again can barely see edges. Okay, so here is a graph, and um, on the left, um, I, I show the adjacency matrix, right? Um, of this graph. So if, uh, you know, if, if two nodes um, on the graph are connected, then um, say in corresponding row and column, there is a non-zero in this matrix, right? And so there are some certain patterns you can see in the matrix um, that corresponds to the graph. So why are we talking about it? Well, the reason is the following. When your graph is pretty large, it's actually very hard to visualize it. But it's much easier to draw this type of a matrix. And if we learn to read the matrix and understand the connectivity in the graph by looking at the matrix, that becomes a pretty powerful tool. So um, in iGraph, um, you, you know, you, you, there is a library sparseM that allows you to do the sort of matrix visualization to actually um, see the, the, the structure of the matrix, the connectivity patterns in the matrix. Um, here is a little bit different picture. Notice um, there is a graph on the right. Um, it, it's much bigger graph than, than before. Uh, I mean, it's not huge, it's a couple hundred nodes, but you already can barely see what's going on in there. And if you look at the matrix, um, it also looks like sort of, you know, 
a noise, literally. Um, there was a connectivity pattern. Well, you, you don't see actually any connectivity patterns. Well, the good news, there are algorithms that allows you to um, do the following. Look, the, the, the way um, things are shown here in the matrix is, a, is, is the following, right? There, are, there is a particular ordering. What I'm, draw, what I'm showing you are the node numbers, right? So every node um, has a number. It's a number. Every vertex has a number. It's one, two, three, you know. I don't know, number four, number five node, number six, number seven node, number eight node. There are nodes that are somehow number. So what one can do is one can try to change those numbering or permute the nodes, or in other way, you know, permute the columns, so exchange the locations of different, of different columns, um, and in, in order to be able to you know, see some structures. And there are various ways to do it. Um, one of the ways is called um, um, bandwidth reduction permutation. And, and the idea here is the following, that you have this matrix, and you try to exchange rows and columns, and that corresponds to renumbering nodes in the graph, such a way that you start seeing structure. And um, there, again, there are different optimization procedures that allows you to do it. Um, one of them, for example, minimum degree ordering, that will really just says, okay, you know, let's take a node with the smallest degree and put it the first one. Let's take a node with the second degree smallest and put it in the third one, second one. The third degree, um, uh, just sort by node degree um, and hope to see the structure. Um, this cut hill key ordering does a little bit different thing, uh, but it also sort of optimizes, it actually optimizes the, the, the width of the graph. And, and so, on this picture, you, I can actually show you the Cuthill-McKee ordering. So what happened is, you know, there is this algorithm that we run, Cuthill-McKee algorithm ordering, that does the, that really permutes, just sort of changes the places for different rows and simultaneously columns. And as a result, it's the same matrix, it's the same data, but being rearranged. And, um, you know, by looking at it, you start seeing certain structures. You actually start seeing, well, there are probably groups of nodes in this graph that are tightly connected. There is another group of nodes that are connected. And there is something going on there. So you realize that, um, you know, the graph is not totally random. It's not a random structure. Um, and again, the good news is that this algorithm are pretty efficient, so you can do it for pretty large graphs. But you can actually do even better than that. Um, last time we talked about uh, community detection and clusters. And, and here is the idea. Um, remember, we looked at the tree, um, at the hierarch when we looked at the hierarchical clustering, we, looked at the, we, we saw the trees, and what's shown here is you know, the bunch of clusters in the graph. Um, now, imagine that we do the following. We have this tree, and now we're going to go um, and number and renumber nodes um, according to this sort of tree structure. So we'll go just top to bottom, and we'll call the, the, that node number one, number two, number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. So what's going to happen is within each cluster, nodes will be numbered consecutively. So we'll know that node, nodes from one to you know ten, fifteen will belong to one cluster. Nodes from you know twenty to five to like you know, 200 will belong to another cluster. And the next sort of sequence of numbers will belong to another cluster. And we, if we do it, we can actually also do the permutation of the matrix and put those guys next to each other. Um, and so what, this is what it's going to look like. So if I take the same, it's the same matrix as we, as, as we looked at. Um, on the right, you see the community structure of the network. And on the left, the corresponding uh, matrix visualization when I did this node renumbering. And what do, you, what do you see instantly on the matrix that the really clusters, and clusters here means groups of nodes, and this means you know, a bunch of nodes connected to each in between themselves, but almost no connection to the rest of the, um, you know, of, of the network. 
So here in this particular graph, you see there is one very tight cluster, another tight cluster, while well, there is a third cluster, fourth cluster, while well, there is a sort of bigger um, cluster in here, and there is some other cluster in there. So this matrix visualization allows you to see clusters in the network without actually drawing a network. Um, now, the, the, the catch here is, you know, to do that, you really need first to, you know, to find the clusters. Um, that's, you know, that, that takes time um, and effort, so it's harder than doing this Cahill Maki. Uh, but still, it is very, very useful. So in many cases, when your graph is large and you cannot really draw it, or if you draw it, it's so complicated you will not be able to see clusters. When you do this matrix visualization, you actually can see the clusters. Um, here is an example. You know, this is on the left. There is this adjacency matrix, and in fact, this matrix corresponds to the graph of size, I think, like you know, 10,000 nodes or so. So yeah, I will not be able to draw it and show it to you. And I want to see if there are clusters in there. So I can run this sort of cluster algorithm, um, get hierarchical clustering tree, and then do the permutation on the matrix the way we discussed, um, and uh, you will start seeing structures. So this is actually extremely, extremely powerful technique. Um, I, I strongly recommend using that, um, again, um, to, go, to go from here to here. What you need to do, you need to run some clustering algorithm, clustering, um, and, and then um, you have that clustering, then you have um, you know, hierarchical tree from that clustering, and then you do uh, permutation of the graph based on that tree. And um, in fact, um, you know, again, in iGraph, um, there is a, where is it here? This dent plot command gives you the tree after the clustering, and you can extract this ordering as I described here, and then you can use it to um, go from you know, this matrix, sort of the matrix A to matrix A given particular permutation. Um, so very, very powerful. Um, now, you know, drawing graphs, it's sort of, you know, art and science and um, science and art. You know, there's a science in actually selecting the right algorithms. There is an art in actually how to draw things. And, you know, honestly, you know, R um, is probably not the best tool to draw um, large graphs because, you know, we pretty much describe what it can do. But there are so many more things the way you can make pictures better. And, um, you know, there, there are lots and lots of optimization you can, you can run. You can make sure, for example, that similar nodes getting close to each other. You can make sure that there is no um, intersection in between edges. Uh, there are lots and lots of things uh, people can do. And there are several algorithms, I mean, several packages out there that helps you with that. So, um, well, GraphBase is a pretty standard, uh, quite old package uh, for algorithms of, of um, graph layouts. In terms of practical applications, I usually use these two guys. Um, it's Gephi or YED. Um, I'll show a few pictures from them a little later. Um, these are also pretty pretty good um, graph layout tools and algorithms. In order to use any of them, uh, what you need to do is you know, take your R program and export um, you know, the data file, the graph file you want to visualize, and then use um, those tools. Um, here is, for example, a, <coughs> a graph done, uh, by, <coughs> done by YED. Uh, if you notice, it's a pretty large network. It is um, um, assortative networks where low degree node connected to high degree nodes. Um, but to make it look so cool, um, what they allowed you to do, on one hand, you know, they, they, they do this sort of connections, but what they also did is they actually allow um, edges to bend. And so you will see that you know, if you have a bunch of points and the connectivity, you will see the edges can actually go sort of around those points. And that's what creates this very, very um, pretty picture. So the fact that the edge doesn't necessarily go straight, but it can avoid nodes um, and connect when connecting to other edges. Now, this is not trivial. Um, you cannot do it in, in, um, in R itself, um, but YAD allows you to do it. 
Um, here is another example from Gephi. Um, also works really, really nicely in, in graph layouts. Um, notice that they also, to make you know, layout nice, they actually uh, curve edges. You know, the edges are not necessarily straight here, um, but that's what creates a sort of nice, um, nice picture and also, of course, scales, uh, you know, scales graph, scales nodes um, in different uh, fashion. So these are the two tools which are probably the best to use uh, for graph visualization. Um, and finally, just want to point you out to um, this really uh, um, nice web page is called Visual Complexity. And if you're interested in you know, the, the graph drawing and graph algorithms and you know, the way to represent the data, um, that, that site contains lots and lots of uh, beautiful visualizations and layouts. And you know, if you're fishing for ideas how to draw things, that's a place to go. Um, and the great thing about that site that it also has uh, pointers to the original data set and quite often to the code that people use to generate those pictures. So that's, I, I think that's a fantastic source uh, to learn about uh, you know, visualization for, for the networks. Um, so that's pretty much it for today. Um, just a quick summary of uh, what we did. We, we, we talked about, we started by um, looking at um, k cores uh, by being able to pull out uh, you know, the, 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 the centroid of the graphs, um, and here is a reference for that. Um, we then looked at their various network mod. Uh, we looked at actually dyads and triads, um, and then we looked at different network motifs. Um, and uh, finally, we talked about this assortive, disassortive mi mixing, um, and uh, that's a reference for that. And there is no reference. Um, I'll put the, put a reference there later um, on various uh, sort of algorithm for uh, graph visualization. So that's sort of a quick summary. Um, again, the goal for today was to you know teach you a little bit of how you can analyze network with sort of the, the low cost tools, um, but those that will give you um, some idea of what your network is and what it looks like. We're done. Any questions? Uh, is it possible to upload the presentation into your site? Because there is no lecture of this just now on this site. Oh, can you can you uh, ask it again? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand it. I just asked about is it possible to upload your presentation uh, into your site? Because oh, it is. Yeah, it is. It is online. I mean, this will be online. You know, in in, in an hour or so. No, I, I'm not about so the video presentation. I, I just about the materials because it's sometimes really useful to look at uh, the lecture and to do the lab. Oh, the slides, the slides should be also there. There are links to the slides. Well, I just, just look now and there are no concerns on the side about the uh, Hold on a sec. Uh, 